welcome uh, everyone to MSD Public Lecture Series with uh, Roger Rieve. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am, the lands of Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respect to their elders past, present, and those emerging, and to all Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders witnessing this event. Uh, I am George Stiano, a senior lecturer in architectural design here at uh, the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at University of Melbourne. My pleasure is to introduce uh, Roger Rieve. Um, his uh, lecture is titled Determined, Non-Determined. Roger will speak about um, the residential development, uh, their project in, uh, in Grass Strasgang, um, um, multi-unit residential project uh, that um, Roger Rieve and uh, Florian Riegler have uh, completed in 1994. Their office has uh, grown, uh, grown um, immensely since uh, then. Uh, now they're uh, based in Graz in Berlin, uh, working on uh, more uh, complex and uh, larger pr projects. Uh, uh, Roger is also professor at um, TU Graz. He's a head of Institute of Architectural Technology there. Uh, and that will be all uh, from me. I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Roger. Uh, just uh, one very last thing, uh, question and answer function will be open. Uh, if uh, uh, any questions come out, uh, please uh, use that one uh, either through or uh, toward the end of the lecture. That will be all for me. Thanks uh, very much, Roger, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Roger, for the um, invitation and also for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to lecture for you and even if we've got this online uh, tool at the moment, so we don't, I don't have to travel from, say, Austria down to, to Australia. And uh, but still, I hope it will work well, and we can maybe have a good discussion after um, the lecture. <clears throat> we start. Wait, let me see. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, that's working very well. Okay, good. Well, as you said in the introduction already, um, we are based in, in Graz and in Graz, Austria and in Berlin. And uh, since many years, we've been working on housing projects, but also on infrastructure projects and uh, educational projects, museums and so on. And the, the kind of credo of the office is that every project we tackle, it has to be an interesting project. We just don't like boring stuff. We don't like normal stuff. Uh, so we actually endeavor in, in really good, exciting architecture. And sometimes we just stop a project and we say it's not interesting anymore, or it's too complicated, or nobody's understanding what we are talking about. And so this needs some, some process, and sometimes we are lucky. We do a lot of competitions, many competitions, most of them we lose, because nobody under really understands what we're really doing, and sometimes we win, and then we're really lucky. And um, <clears throat> because in these competitions, which usually are anonymous, uh, we're not able to explain our ideas verbally. It's just, you know, the panels you have and then the jury where maybe doesn't have enough time to, to study the projects and then things get tangled and we become kind of um, a mess. So now I would take this opportunity to um, show a few projects and go into sometimes into detail because this may be interesting because it's a university audience or say students um, being on the other side and um, so we can talk about different things which you usually don't talk about in a very normal say um, big lecture okay now wait, let me get into this I'll start off with the Strasskan project, as I said before, one of the projects which uh, actually put us on, on the, the, the map. Um, this was actually not a competition. Uh, this was a direct commission, but there was a, a project uh, before that. It was a competition, an invited competition um, for low cost um, public housing with six participants and they said, the brief said the first three would win. And there were 60 criteria. And um, then we said, well, there's no problem. We will at least get the third prize so we can build. 
And then finally we got the fourth prize. And, but we won all the 60 criteria. And then there was a press conference and it was a huge scandal uh, what had happened here. And then the jury said, well, we were not courageous enough to give these young guys a prize because we just don't know what will happen to society if they start building these things. It was so strange. And a few years later, a politician came to us and said, I remember you guys, you know, fighting everybody. And uh, now try to prove what you've been talking about. So we like completely scared and said oh god now we have to do the things we actually were anticipating and then this project came up so they gave us like free hand and said okay please design a low budget public housing project and finally it came up as a project which was so cheap it was cheaper than any other project built in the last 20 years and it was about 20 percent cheaper than anything else we had before and we were able to actually put a lot of things we were talking about in our theory into this project and would like to lead you actually through this project. Determined, non-determined. So it's the, the, the basic thing of saying, um, we would like to actually reduce the determined, the, 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 the functions of determined spaces in an apartment, for example, or also it's in, uh, urban planning or in the trade fair or a museum to absolute minimum. So to be able to maximize the non-determined space because we have a strong belief that we just don't know what is happening in these apartments. There's so many architects claiming they are specific housing architects. They know exactly how the people live. We say we don't even know ourselves how we want to live. We are changing our apartments all the time. And why should the people moving into our apartments know exactly what we have been actually thinking for them to be done? So we try to figure out that the non-determined space is as big as possible. This finally goes into a very high degree of um, abstraction, abstractness, actually to, to liberate the other spaces in a project. This is the, the, the facade. Um, the east facade of this project. It's actually only a three, three level uh, floor and project. So it's, it's just like, I think 24 apartments. And uh, so we were able to actually turn around every second detail more often thinking about it or what to do and how to change it and how to make it viable and things people have never seen before and never used before. <clears throat> so it looks like when it was built very, rough, very hard, like unfriendly. And, um, but we still believe, we said, no, the people will move in and then they will start changing the place. They will start occupying the place. They will start utilizing the place. Uh, we don't worry about that. It is like tough at the moment, the first moment you have to move in, but it will always change. And there has to be enough um, kind of freedom for making these changes um, possible. So this was actually was finished when, when we built it. Looking at the plan, we actually designed um, a two-room apartment and a four-room apartment. This was the brief. And uh, then we said, well, let's change it a little bit. Let's make the two-room apartment a two and a half room and the four-room four and a half room. And this was public housing. So we had to get the subsidies and Actually, this project was rejected three times because the local government said, no, go, no way, we will never build a project like this because the structure of the local families will be completely destroyed. It's a mess and there's no family life in there anymore. And then we also asked the question, what families are you talking about? Because there's not, you know, the um, double income, two kid family anymore, but we've got all different kinds of families and all different kinds of groups, ethnicities, and so on. Moving into this apartment, nobody knows what will be going on. So that's why we actually claim to say we want to have this half a room. Can you see my, my point on my cursor? So this is like the two-room apartment, one room, a second room, and this is the small half room. And the four-room apartment, one, two, three, four, and half a room. So the 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 Local government always asks, what is this half room about? And we say, we don't know. There's no function, it's just half a room. 
And they said, they never had something like this. And we said, okay, but the people will find out what they want to do in this half room. It's, it's tiny, but it will work. So the idea was to say in the, in the left-hand side, I'm showing this, um, the two room apartment. You see, of course, all the determined spaces in the middle of sanitary, the kitchen, uh, bathroom, and so on. So you can have a living room here, you can have a bedroom here, but you can have living room here, you can have a dining room here, you can have a bedroom here, you can have a studio here, or you have a small kid. Um, you're born, you can put it here, then you would have a living room here and maybe another bedroom here. So there are many options all of a sudden. <clears throat> and the same with the four room department as well. So this half a room was, what was very, very important. So after rejecting it, this project three times, they said they will never give money for this project. Uh, we were kind of pushed into making a deal with the government, which is this. They said, we don't believe your half room, but now this is the apartment we were designing. One, two rooms and the half room and the kitchen here and the bathroom here. So the local government said, we will design a kitchen in the half room, which obviously looks like a kitchen. And then there are two rooms here. So this is the specific, well, the usual two, two room apartment plus, plus a kitchen. And the same with the um, four room, again, the kitchen in the small space, and then the four rooms, and then you see the kitchen is missing in, in this part. So they say, they claim they want to have 30% and we were allowed to do 70% the way we wanted to have it. So there are two different apartments in this housing project. And when the people moved in, first they found out, well, it's quite interesting. Then um, they suddenly found out, well, if I've got the kitchen, I've got the kitchen here, this has to be the dining room. This cannot be a bedroom. So all of a sudden, all the other spaces became completely determined just by putting the kitchen from here to here. It's a very small move. You don't really notice when you have a quick look at, at the apartment. But here it is possible if you have, say, the living room here, a living dining room here, maybe a bedroom here, and the kit or studio here, like home office. Nobody was talking about that, about that at that time. Then you could have two bedrooms here. Or you can say, this is my more public part in the apartment. Uh, living and dining, these are the bedrooms and I've got my working space over here or another small kid or grandfather, grandmother, whatever, over here. And this is what the people found out themselves. And they said, well, these other apartments, they are so interesting. And then we said, when we designed it, um, it has to be as abstract as possible that we also were working on the um, layout of the power plugs, which we think is very important. There's a certain amount of power plugs you can use for public housing per square meter. And then there is, is, there's a specific connotation of one room having the power plugs one meter 40 apart. So this is always the master bedroom where you put the big bed and you have to sleep there the rest of your life with your partner. And so we spread the, the power plugs all evenly around the whole apartment. So you couldn't find out where is the master bedroom. And this was actually the freaking point for the people to think about how do I want to actually live in these in this apartment. And after a few after two, three years, we made a survey uh, to find out what had happened actually to these um, apartments. And we asked um, Bas Prinsen, a photographer from uh, Holland, uh, actually who is very well known in, in the realm of uh, dirty reality photography to take pictures of these apartments. And um, he had never done that before. And he said, because they usually there's pictures of landscapes, which is a different dimension. And then finally he said, okay, I know which camera I can use, which lens I can use and so on. And, but the people are not allowed to tidy up their apartments. He wants to have it as dirty as possible. And this is highly interesting because this was the thing we were always talking about. We don't know how people are living and we don't know ourselves how we want to live. <clears throat> so we've got this very abstract apartment. You remember with the kitchen part in the middle, the determined space. And this is the reality. And we think this is fantastic. 
you obviously see there's some small kid uh, somewhere around in this apartment. You see the kind of strange shells so nobody can bump his head. And it has been kind of utilized in a very specific way, in a very kind of personal way, even putting up tents inside the apartment, something you as an architect can never think about. And we think this is so much, there's so much uh, richness in this um, attitude, which is fascinating. <clears throat> or again, the same situation in another apartment with the kitchen part in the middle, but now the kitchen has been uh, elongated and there's an aquarium here and stuff like that. And, uh, you notice that they are really, you know, into it of trying to use it and to make it their own, their own apartment because the possibility is given because of the space, the space is being so abstract. Or that people even bring in the motorbike, you know, this is the part from the small bedroom to the big bedroom, or we'll say to the uh, living room, and then you suddenly see, oh, in this motorbike, there are even two power plugs. So you see, oh, it's, it's actually just the image of, of the motorbike. But these power plugs were put in the middle here because there are two sliding doors, and so the power plug will still work. And something we cannot imagine if you would make a rendering of an apartment, you see these specific typical architects' renderings for competitions and projects, uh, you would never show something like this. And we say, but this is the reality, this is the fun part, this is actually where we can actually make a get, get the people to smile about the apartment and the way they can be living. And also for the outside, for the landscape part um, of this project, this is the, the western facade. Um, the, the, we put in three different kinds of shrubs, all flowering white at a certain time of the year. And we distributed all these shrubs because we had a certain amount of shrubs which we had to plant uh, evenly. So like a grid, which looked in a way very frightening and then people started changing. They moved in, they started changing. They took out shrubs and put them close to the apartment. Then they also started putting the um, Christmas trees, planting them in between in these rows. Now it is completely green. green. It's like a big forest. It's, it's so funny because we couldn't imagine this to happen before. So we also noticed here by having this abstractness that people actually then went into it and started making it their own, of occupying it and of utilizing it. Also, the facade I started up with um, on the, the, the western side, uh, on the eastern side, sorry, with the stretched metal, which is um, very rough, um, then has been occupied in this way. And that shrubs are growing, it is completely green. That it's, it's hard to imagine what it looked like actually when we, when we built it. And this facade itself, maybe I'll quickly jump back to one. Um, it's a prefab concrete facade. The, on this facade side, we've got stretched metal, so it's the galvanized stretched metal facade. And this um, facade itself is not load bearing. It looks like, like it's a load bearing facade, but it's not. Actually, all the um, walls inside, the, the partition walls are load bearing. So this was also the idea that we, we have a strong belief that um, we all as, as a society are in a way lazy. And there were all these programs in the 60s um, that you can adapt your apartment by shifting walls. So all the walls had to be movable. And we never believed in this because we're just too lazy to move a wall inside our apartment because then there's a hole in the carpet and you have to buy a new carpet and the power plugs on the wrong place and so on. So we made all the uh, partition walls inside the apartment load bearing concrete walls because nobody will move them and they cannot be moved. And that's why the facade is not load bearing. So that we were free to design it. And then the, the elements you see here, the, the sliding elements as a breeze soleil uh, makes this facade actually change constantly. So during the day, during the evening, whenever the, the people can actually open the window and then just move the facade, uh, move the, the sliding elements. So it's actually a, very, a facade which is very much alive. Maybe the first steps into bionic, bionic um, uh, facade. <clears throat> and there also no um, no balconies, you may be noticed. We said we would we've got French windows, French balconies, so the doors open to the inside. You're actually like in public space already, but you should ut utilize the public space provided. And so it's actually something which really happens that the people spend a lot of their time 
outside in the garden, in the, in the public space between these um, apartments. So it's always the, the thing of um, thinking about how will the project be used when it finished designing and we finished building it. <clears throat> this is actually more important for our design process than thinking of what should it look like? Is it a tall building? Is it a high rise? Is it a flat building or whatever? It's, it's more about the, the realm of utilization, which actually triggers off the design process in, um, in our office. <clears throat> and a project actually, which we made before that, was also um, subsidized or public housing, also in Graz. And finally, this became actually the most expensive housing project, um, I think, between Graz and Paris. And this also gave us the, the notion we said uh, with the other project I just showed, uh, we have to be able to make low budget projects just by constructing it in a different way. And uh, then we started writing kind of an internal uh, own manifesto of what has to be changed and what has to be done. And we said, this is actually just wasting a lot of public money. But still, it's a very um, interesting project. This was a competition actually, but run organized by 12 families. They bought a site and then they invited architects whom they thought were interesting. And then we, there was a jury and we were able to win um, this project. And then we had to design, the design phase took five years. It was so intense, the participation with these people, the people, the, the owners, they were um, university staff, um, mathematics and psychology. And uh, obviously they had a lot of time to talk to us and, and to go into this planning process and which was um, very partly very tiring because the idea we had on this site is, so it is a very slopey site to have more or less um, these longitudinal rectangular um, boxes, maybe for, uh, floor plans um, with the, the idea actually to say, this is my cursor here, um, everybody gets something like this as, as a box. The most important thing is for the community to have a wall. Everybody gets a wall with only one small opening. And of course, the, the 12 families, they thought we are friends. We want to have like one mutual space. And, and, and so on, we said, no, you are friends now, but in, in future, maybe you would not like each other anymore. So in order to protect yourself, we we'll give you a wall. And then we have like two small public squares inside here and a very narrow kind of pathway leading through here and a wider one on this side and it goes down the slope. So finally, if you come up from the street, go down there, it's like, um, eight floors you have to go down. So it's, it's very steep. And we put all these uh, um, apartments on the upper side uh, of the site. And the ground floor, everybody has a ground floor, is actually looks the same inside the apartment. When we say this is maybe something like a summer kitchen, because in the go back again, there's a kitchen on the upper floor here, and there's a kitchen the sameness on the ground floor with the atrium with a kind of very private garden, a winter garden and the more public garden outside here. And this was the basics actually where we started off, said, okay, this is the, the grammar, the, the structure of this building uh, of, of your project. And then let's see where we can make ends meet and how these apartments will develop, but we will stick to the urban, urbanistic approach in this project of having say the wall, the two public squares, which are very specific um, in their layout and also in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and we actually told them that we have to keep everything they do, they want to design and redesign, it always has to be inside this volume of the big kind of boxes we are um, proposing. And this then took like three to three years, we started building, so five years altogether in this space. So let's run and, and then when we, Again, we, we uh, asked Bus Prince to actually make a survey um, of this project and to find out what has actually happened in the meantime. <clears throat> and this is one of these doors, these holes, the opening, the entrance um, into the apartment. <clears throat> and these apartments look different you, than the one I just showed. Uh, people have a piano, although there are lots of 
toys on the piano? Is they don't really know if somebody is really playing the piano? Is it just the image of a piano? So it's a very different kind of atmosphere in these apartments. And also here you see the kitchen, something we were not able actually to design, but the people do these things um, themselves. Also, like, <coughs> excuse me, the um, living room uh, with the fitness bicycles, um, towels, uh, all part of the living culture, something you would, if you make a rendering for a competition, you would never make a rendering like this because they say you've got no idea what the people are doing, but we think this is actually real life. And actually they got the frame to kind of utilize the frame for the specific use or say if so, some sports or billiard or uh, and another piano somewhere around. So it's highly interesting. And we still say that the urbanistic thing has actually been kept, which is the most the strongest part. And these people have been living there now for 25 years and more than 25 years. And after 25 years, they made a big party and they invited us and they're still there. And they said the toughest part for them in the design process was that we forced them to keep to this wall and only a small door. And then they found out this was the best part of the whole project because there were parts when maybe somebody got divorced, somebody moved out, somebody moved back again, they didn't like each other anymore, <laughs> and so on. And so they really appreciated um, this wall with a, with a very small door. So this is these, these boxes and you see the, the kitchens kind of kind of popping out. You see these atriums, the big frames we actually set, which they then can um, utilize. And and now the whole thing looks like this, which is incredible. So the 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 the, the value of these these apartments. These are just 120 square meter, meter apartments, but they like small houses here uh, is incredible. The view, the atmospheres, every apartment has a different atmosphere also due to the location on the site, on this very steep slope of the site. And it's fantastic to see after 25 years that they're absolutely happy and fascinated with this. And of course, there's a change of generation. The kids got all this started studying. Maybe the kids moved into the apartments. But they're actually holding to holding to this these apartments because I think it's the best project they ever noticed. But it was hard and enduring actually in the in the design process. So again, this is the the issue of the determined and the non-determined to keep the frame. It's like as we say always a, a grammar uh, which we have to imply in a project. If, if the grammar is precise, then you can write a fantastic essay. If the grammar is, doesn't work, you cannot write a letter. You cannot even read a letter. Going along with another project we did in outside Graz in, in the mountains, in a, in a valley actually, a very narrow valley. And again, it was this idea of um, how to offer actually in the countryside apartments with actually, as you always know, maybe it's all around the world, the countryside is mostly very conservative and different and it's not maybe our real, but to offer an apartment um, in, in plan, uh, which can you to be utilized the way we're always talking about. So this is actually the, the principal layout of having these very narrow um, blocks of buildings with a mutual space in between. And then to develop an apartment, I'm going to this one, <laughs> where I would claim if as a student, if you would design an apartment like that, the professor would say, oh, you didn't get the the message is completely wrong. So we like to do wrong things because here we've got, say, the living room and here the kitchen dining room and in between bedrooms. So usually you would put the kitchen next to the living room. So all of this is more the public. And then you have the, as we always say, the sleeping appendix somewhere else. But what we did, we said, no, we want the people to go um, up and down um, in, in the apartment, so actually to utilize the space from that public part to that public part, and we widen it. It's not one meter 20, this is like close to two meters, two meter 10, because the stack is coming up here. 
from the bottom with the entrance area. And this is a, a space non-determined where we don't know what is really, what can really happen. <clears throat> so it's, you see here with the kitchen, and then maybe you can use this for homework, for schoolwork, whatever, and the, and the apartment here. And then we called in bus prints also to analyze this project as a photographer. And this is now this corridor, which is too wide. And what we did was actually, we put a window, which is too low. So when you walk, you cannot see outside. And we installed this windowsill, which is big, like a table. So all of a sudden, the people, they moved in, they found out, okay, we can you know, put the, the uh, hi-fi uh, things here or have the vacuum cleaner here. Some people even put the, the living room in, in this part. And you can only see outside when you're sitting. So you can do your homework here, you can see outside. And it was so fascinating because when we were, this project was under construction and you could see these windows and everybody there was talk of this village. They said, well, these windows are completely wrong. This must be something like a car park or whatever they are building. And nobody could imagine that uh, this, these could be apartments. <clears throat> and then where I was talking of, say, the, the living room, and on the right-hand side, you see the, the windowsill, those wide corridors, and you see there's a bedroom there. There's no living room. So they actually reorganize it. This is the apartment where actually they put the, the living room into this double size um, corridor. <clears throat> And all these atmospheres inside here, which we cannot really imagine, and everybody's got to say a different attitude of, of living, uh, we find in, in these apartments, which we think is good that actually the frame was given, and then they can um, utilize it. Also on the outside, uh, different, as we say, like the secondary um, architectures are, are happening, balustrade, these doors, this plastic stuff. Um, coming along and they really enjoy um, living in this place and they're very proud because for a long time they were like the outcast in this village everybody hated this project and but they noticed many architects came visiting the project and it's, it became very interesting and now they're very proud that they were actually the first kind of outlaws in this village and they managed to stay and now they actually notice how good these um, apartments are <clears throat> Going to another project, again, the topic of determined, non-determined, which is like a, a bottom line in, in all our, um, from very many of our projects. This is a, a private client that actually came to us and he was able to buy a, a, a loft uh, here in, in Graz. And uh, the story behind it is, um, it was a couple with a son, but they um, got divorced some time ago before, and then they kind of met up again. And then they said, okay, we'll try to make this project together and, you know, set up a new life. So we as architects were kind of psychologists as well and uh, working on this project. And we noticed that in the meantime, the five years they were like separated, they had developed their own lives. And now they were trying to put these lives back together again. And this was very tough. And we noticed there's some trouble coming up. So the one that collected coffee machines, the other was busy doing a different hobby. And we said, the only thing we can do is for you is to make this one big cupboard. Because it was a completely open space, just the, the, the staircase and the elevator with the direct access to the apartment. And we had all the space provided. We said, we'll give you one huge cupboard, multifunctional cupboard. In this cupboard, you will have bathrooms, toilets, and so on. But you can put all your stuff you've been collecting in the meantime into this cupboard. And then the rest of the space here is completely free for your new life. First, they were very disappointed. They said, but there are no rooms in this apartment. What is this? We went to an architect to have a real plan, but there's no, no plan. And then they found out about the specificities of, of this thing. And we've got the master bedroom here, the ensuite um, bathroom on this side, the, the bedroom for the son on this side. So actually it works as an open kitchen. Uh, there's a studio space or working space at the back here, but one big space and in the staircase leading up um, to the a rooftop with a rooftop swimming pool. <clears throat> so this is the space inside. 
On the right hand side, you see this big kind of neutral cupboard where they could dump all the stuff. And it's absolutely clean. So it was actually for them to buy new furniture, new carpets, uh, don't know what. And the, the kitchen was installed already. Here's a kind of uh, island situation. And on the other side, this is the this picture was taken from the, the bedroom of the sun, the, the bathroom, the toilet, you've got the wardrobe, and then you can even look right down to the past the elevator, down to the master bedroom, down to the ensuite um, bathroom of the master bedroom. <clears throat> and then we, before they actually moved in, we gave them some examples of how to put furniture because they had no idea of how to utilize the space. And we thought, this is really interesting. And they went off shopping and, and stuff like that and to you know, get the couch and the tables and the dining room table and, and things they could actually put in. They really enjoyed the space. This is the view from the kitchen going up. The staircase going up to the rooftop with a fantastic view. Terrace of Graz and with a small stairs here in, the, in the background you see here, this is actually a small bathtub, so like a bigger jacuzzi. <clears throat> fantastic space. And it worked for, for, I think, five years, and then they got divorced again. So this is the sad part of the of the story. Architects can't make everything possible, but finally, this apartment was sold as the most most expensive apartment um, in town a few years ago when they split up again. So we can't solve all problems, but at least we can try to solve things or actually to be helpful for um, spaces and, and areas to be utilized. I'll jump the scale. I'll jump into a, an urban scale. You will see here the, the determined and non-determined uh, issues are, I think, very important for the design process. And for this um, figure ground plan, which we always have a strong belief in that when you draw up this plan with a project and you don't really notice where the project is, then the first step is actually quite okay already. So we're confident with this. And this is in Munich. This is in Munich, in the southeast of Munich. Perlach, this, uh, the region is actually was built in the 70s as a satellite town um, with a lot of ideology, huge buildings, structures, uh, concrete, and, and so on, um, which you see, which you see here as a kind of figure plan already over here, over here. <clears throat> and then years later, single family houses, detached houses semi-detached houses came along here. So very different parts. And then this is all a nature reserve over here. And the project I will be focusing on is this one here. As a missing link between the single family houses and the satellite town, the brutalist buildings, uh, also a missing link between the, um, say the, the, the urbanized part here and the nature reserve over here, kind of putting it are going right into the project here. We can show you here on this side. So it's actually of trying to develop blocks, trying to develop high rises in this part. So like the missing link um, on this side with semi-detached houses or townhouses as kind of a link to these semi-detached houses on that side, urbanizing it, rising here in, in height up to the, say, these brutalist buildings on the side, which were existing and at the same time providing a huge park for all, not only for these people here, these are like 1,200 apartments, but also for the people from the neighborhood to come here. So there was a big issue about this park, this part over here. This was also a competition we were able to win. And then we drew up the, the master plan and finally we were able to build some projects inside this project it's under construction at the moment. So these are like a few ideas of the height, the development of height, um, the, the airflow going through, this had to be kept open to keep the airflow. So the microclimate has become very important in our projects as well as part of the issues of sustainability and how it is actually then embedded um, in this um, realm which was given um, in, in Perla. After we won this competition, we had to go through a lot of issues with the uh, municipality, the urban planning department, um, traffic department, um, parks department, and so on, to actually put forward these issues, which we were 
think are, were so important. So one of these things was this street, this part here. <clears throat> this is south, facing south. So in Austria, the sun at lunchtime comes from the south. In Australia, it's from the north, which would be the other way around. And we said this should be a park for all. So we don't want to have any housing any built projects on this side here, we've got them on this side, more or less closing the park, <clears throat> and only having buildings on one side, and this is like a promenade, you see here with the, the three rows of trees, and then the politician said, but nobody has ever built something like that before. We said, no, but this is so, uh, so high value because this is facing south, so there's sun at lunchtime, and you can have cafes here, you can have a bicycle shop here, you can have a supermarket here, and everybody can run into, into this park. So it is really public. So we managed to keep this idea. Then there were other issues because there are 1,200 apartments, 4,000 people. So the bottleneck you have in this urban development is uh, the, the kindergarten and the um, primary school, because these are the kids that cannot travel by bus. So they're like three kindergartens, uh, in this area, one is here, one is here, and one is here just for the, the kids in, in this area. But we also put bus routes through, so defining where are um, bus stops uh, in, this, in this area, so it's highly um, public. And finally coming up with a, with a plan like this, where you can see that the public, the, the, the nature reserve actually moves into this public part here, and uh, providing enough space for all of these people which are living here, maybe with a slightly high density or these high rises here, uh, we can then utilize this park in the same time have a promenade here, which is a public uh, space, a semi-public space, which we think is very important. Then we said that to be able to implement this, the ground floor in these buildings, we actually put this into the master plan have to be four meters high and accessible from, from ground floor level. All the other blocks, they're always like 80 centimeters higher. So all the ground floor apartments are 80 centimeters above um, the street level, except for this, this row alongside here. So it's actually like hinting at those people who will be renting the spaces or buying them, uh, how to use them without actually writing, uh, this is a cafe or this is a bicycle shop or whatever. So you can see the, the whole setup. This is the, the existing the satellite town with these huge buildings, the very small ones, private houses over here and the missing link then in between. Mm -hmm. And this is the highly specific promenade, which we were actually always fighting for and arguing for, which we thought was so important. <clears throat> the kindergartens, which then also need a lot of green, and these this green is not only park part of the park, but the problem is always that you need a fence so the small ones and the toddlers don't run away. So it is like semi-public, um, which you have to take into consideration when drawing up a park. And this is again the, the part where you can, we can imagine to have cafes, supermarkets, uh, restaurants, and things like this, to have a more public zone inside um, this area. <clears throat> First rendering of how we can imagine that this area can can look like to just you know push the client. There's only one client uh, investing in this whole area, so it's a huge project for one client. Um, but they <clears throat> were courageous enough then finally to uh, kick off. Then we were also asked to do something like a design guide for this whole area. So we said it has to be very simple because we will not do all the architecture, other architects will be called in. And it, the codes have to be very simple, just the color. Um, so all the resets are like have a color, the, the normal facades are like white. And um, going up to details of balustrades, 80 centimeters high and so on. Then we were asked to do actually two projects inside uh, this, the one at the top where the, the, the block is actually realized and the other one, the high rise and the kindergarten is under construction right at the moment. The, the one issue we had for these blocks is also to say the fire brigade, the cars, the trucks should not go through the block. So we've got more space for green inside. So it's only from the outside. And when it's only from the outside, then you have a very specific typology. 
um, which partly becomes very really difficult if you've got south facing apartments. Uh, which are the sunny apartments, and then there should not be a fire brigade always coming from the other side. For the rendering, this was the one block saying, okay, these are the codes we actually used as a kind of prototype. And then finally, it was um, the first part was built actually to show others um, how it would work. A very simple layout of these very simple windows, just a little bit of color. Um, and just before, uh, just when it was completed in winter. Uh, so now in the meantime, it is very green and then uh, being utilized. And the other project, the high rise project, uh, which is like a cornerstone in, in this uh, old urban development with a um, big um, restaurant and public space, which we call um, here an urban living room. We said we don't really know what it will be, but this is just one space a non-commercial space actually for this whole area everybody can use and this is just for bicycles and the, the fresh the kindergarten um, on this side the public park in, in front just to get this imagination of this fantastic um, building of 14 floors with a view um, a lot of sunlight a lot of say um, positive atmosphere um, for this high rise which is like a little bit like a rhomboid um, being built under construction at the moment and with the promenade as it is in the latest last design, but under construction at the moment as well. So we hope that everything should be done in about two or three years time. So these urban um, developments take a lot of time and uh, you need a lot of energy to actually push the projects through all these different bureaucratic um, hurdles which you actually find from urban de planning urban planning uh, traffic planning um, landscaping um, nature and so on but which is also interesting actually then um, like a massage which which you do with these people for years uh, to be able to put the quality to these projects which you are busy right at the moment for a project in Kiel, Kiel in, in the Kiel city in, in Germany, a harbor city at the Baltic Sea in the coast. And uh, this was an area, the former area of the German army. And they, they moved out and the city of Kiel bought this area, which is 90 hectares. So it's huge. And the development, which you see here is about 50 hectares um, with one part we go through that here this part here will be mainly for housing this is a mixed zone and this is like a semi-industrial commercial zone um, over here and in this part we've got more than 2200 apartments so about 6000 7000 people um, will be moving there so it's huge it will be like a whole town or city quarter in Kiel. and this process again we were asked to do the the master plan Till end of the year we have to be done because next year um, they actually will start you know building the streets and things like that so all these issues are being put on the map again of kind of reorganizing it shifting it a little bit so the um the situation at the moment are the the, the black areas so the surfaces the houses the competition was actually the red outline so you see things have been moved a little bit but still keeping to the idea which we have saying, for example, um, in the housing part here, we don't have subterranean underground car parking. There's no car parking, so there will be no traffic. So what we have, we've got mobility hubs here, we've got mobility hub here, here, and so on, uh, and here, and like a walking distance of 300 to 400 meters, so everybody has to put his car here, and there's no traffic here. So we due to the fact we've got no underground car parking here, we can actually utilize this as a green area or children's playground or whatever. And of course, the whole atmosphere here will be completely different because it is car free. <clears throat> In the meantime, we were asked to put a school here. We didn't have a school before, so this has changed. This is a high rise of a hotel and residential tower. <clears throat> we're to start working on redrawing the coastline due to certain constraints of ownerships, of currents, and, and so on. So you see the, um, the new one is actually the turquoise or blue line, and the one we had in the competition was the red line. So we had actually more in-cuts, like small harbors in this part, and uh, which, were, which we cannot actually uh, realize. 
then we're asking, you know, how high are these buildings? Where to put all these apartments? This has to be evaluated and all the time, every like every three weeks, all the municipality, like 20, 30 people on the table at the table to dis discuss these things, how how we actually see the 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 topography of the of, of these buildings because they were always asking to have right at the corner, cornerstone, which would be a really high rise building. But we say this is too rhetoric. We want to have the high rise over here in the second row at the back because they would like to see the sea as well. So this can be not so high, but it can be dominant at the same time. <clears throat> and then of course, always trying to show the politicians uh, what the atmosphere is, what the dimensions of public space or private space will be. Also to tell them how we can imagine where, where will we have housing, where will we have like gastronomy or shops, or where will there be a kindergarten or now the school is, has come inside. So everything is actually determined by us as an architects and urban planning team um, for them actually then to be able to realize this huge project. And also the promenade, which is um, very important as a public space, uh, the fantastic setting of how to develop this with a public um, swimming pool um, alongside here. So it's not a, a normal swimming pool with a fence around, it's just public, everybody can use it. This is for the ferries um, going into town, a kind of water taxi, developing specific you know, situations, dimensions, of the promenade, how wide can it be? Uh, what are the qualities? Uh, what are the what is the topography like? Because we've got low tide, we've got high tide. We also have like a small harbor basin, but just by, for example, inserting a bridge here for the pedestrians determines which boats can actually enter this basin. So it cannot be a big boat, just small boats, dinghies and so on. No sailing boat can actually enter here just because of this bridge. So there's a long discussion, should this bridge be here or not? If there's not a bridge, then there are different boats here, but then maybe the dimension is not big enough and so on. So these are the fascinating parts uh, where we write at the beginning, the starting point to actually then make these things fit. And then also we've got, as I said before, uh, low tide, high tide. But we were also asked to um, make this whole area safe for the um, rise of the sea level in the next 100 years, which uh, according to scientists will be 60 centimeters. And so, it, so we are not in a flooded area after 100 years when the water, the sea level will rise by um, 60 centimeters. So also this had to be taken in consideration already. <clears throat> children's playgrounds, which is like an, a legal issue as well, just to fit them all over in this area. So we've got the safe place, the kids can run around, there are no cars or hardly any cars and so on. <laughs> right up to um, existing huge structures, military structures of reusing them because we say we shouldn't actually demolish them. We cannot build them nowadays anymore. They're just too big but to say they can be like containers inside using references um designing you know the, the spaces for cultural events offices startups um, inside um, these buildings which maybe will be looking like that so these are the the, the parts again where we play this determined non-determined part uh, which are the cornerstones which we think are very in, important also say in the urban planning issue as well as say in the um smaller projects or very small projects or housing projects <coughs> And the hotel tower, which is a, a hybrid actually, to say there's certain clause for hotel, but also for housing, because the hotel would may, maybe be too big. Um, of course, here then the politicians would say, well, we you don't have these things regularly, but maybe we can try, then you have to start convincing them, massaging them, as we always say, and then trying to be able to realize these projects. Um, one of the, these days and to say that this hybrid can work as a hotel or as housing, it doesn't matter how many floors you can decide right at the very end. So this is the whole view of the, the site. There's a small airport in the in the background here. There's a slope down here. This is for small planes, but also big planes. Planes can land here, but now it's used actually for private planes. And this is this whole area, which I was talking about over here, going down here and the city center is over here. 
So it's not far, but there's a huge canal between the Baltic Sea and the North Sea going in here for the big ships. So it's like a little bit apart from, from the main part, but we are developing this part and also this part down here, which is all part of the 95 hectares, which will go then under construction in 2025. You see here the hotel tower in the second row at the back, but also the view um, of the sea or of the fjord. Here the harbors are down here. And then you've got connections to Oslo and to Scandinavia, other countries with the big vessels coming in. So it's something very fascinating. I would like to close off with end with a, um, a small project again. And um, this was in, in another province in, in, in Austria, we were asked to do a, a project. Uh, there's an existing villa, which is used with, with apartments. And this was the site. So actually here's the street. So it's actually like a backyard development, but this villa has got a fantastic view of, of the city and the countryside and so on. So what actually made us design a project like this? The one was actually that those people living in the villa should have a good view, even if there are like a lot of apartments to be built here so they can actually see through. So we have to cut open our volume. Then we said, uh, we need all apartments have to be facing west, south because of the sun and east, no apartment to the north. So these were our own kind of office internal criteria. <clears throat> then we said, okay, we'll try to make these things work together to link them again, because small, four small houses are really expensive, especially in terms of accessibility. And then on top, we make like two penthouses. So off we went with this project to say, <clears throat> we've got something like a, a street, semi-public street going through here and through here, there's like a courtyard between these houses. And only two houses have got vertical accessibility. You see the elevator and the staircase here and on this side. And this is the trick. And then you've got always two apartments here and the small private gardens on ground floor. But the private gardens are always a problem because only the ground floor apartments have got these private gardens and the ones above do not. Something which is always annoying. So we try to change this thing. So when we go up first floor, you see that we actually connect these two cubes and this apartment is bigger. These are connected just by the big say, access gallery. You see the, the um, access core here and the access core here. So if you want to go to this apartment, you go with this access or to that apartment, but you cannot go across. <clears throat> now I take you one floor higher. So now the the connection is on this side, on the southern apartment. And over here, which was a floor below with the apartment, is now a roof garden for this apartment. And here I go one, sorry, this so the, the section which you can see where you can actually always see through. And you go one floor higher. Now the connection is on this side, and the roof garden is on this side for this apartment. So there are lots of apartments which have roof gardens, so we actually double the amount of private gardens in this very small apartment building. And then you go up, and again, you've got the next roof garden for this apartment, and these two apartments are then linked with the um, access uh, gallery. And on top, we've got two penthouses, only on these, these two cubes, where you've got the direct access with the vertical access leading to these um, apartments themselves. And these are like uh, just green roofs. <clears throat> so the it's like a kind of uh, urban realm built in a very small project. And again, this idea which I showed with one housing project, the access corridors are wider than usual. They're not one meter 20, but here they're like three meters wide. So you can use the space um, for playing for kids and so on. You see here is the private garden of this um, apartment. And here again, you see the over wide access part, which is a little bit like luxury, but it is a space which you can really use in very different ways, although we don't want to be like telling the people how to use it. And again, you got that on top floor, the same time at the bottom on the ground floor, you can see right down there to the public space. So it's very kind of private atmosphere, but also very um, public atmosphere. 
defining certain parts and certain spaces in this in in this uh, project where the actually the accessibility and the way to access these these small cubes these four cubes was the most important part and when will be built actually everybody can develop his own apartment but we've got these access floors the access galleries on the outside and these roof gardens which we think are very important which we always like keeping to okay guys i think i've done it thank you very much for your attention Thank you, thank you, Roger. That was uh, great. Thanks so much for for the great lecture. Um, let's see if uh, we have any questions from uh, from the audience. Um, can Can you read uh, in the question and answers chat box, or do you want me to try to read for you the ones that uh, that are there? I just saw one notice, but maybe you can read it because otherwise I have to look yeah. for it again. Yeah, yeah, I'll give it. To, I'll give it the best. Um, uh, you have convinced me of the beauty in non-determined space, and I want to dig deeper. Could you point me in any past architect's presence to text that influenced you or share any experiences that led you to appreciate non-determination? Who are the godfathers? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Well, say just in, in, in um, say formal aesthetic architecture, of course, uh, Mies van der Rohe is always one of our godfathers. And, uh, but we think that um, architecture goes along with the development of society. So in, in periods and, and decades and things like that. So especially in the 60s, 70s, when we had these big satellite towns being built, there was a lot of ideology, the metabolists were around and so on. And so we studied these projects and then we noticed, as I said before, um, these things never really worked and somehow they, they never came to work because there was too much maybe ideology in it of architects telling the people what to do. And we say, no, we just want to make this frame, this grammar, and then they will find out themselves. Maybe it is a little bit demanding because we don't tell them what to do, but we think this is more freedom. This is more part of our society because uh, for, especially for housing, this is the most fascinating part. Um, we all know to know that in the last three years, things have changed considerably due to Corona, to COVID, uh, home officing and so on. And suddenly the families are at home, you have to work at home. The apartment is too small, nothing is working. It's a complete blow, it's a disaster. Of course, we don't want to have COVID all the time, but we notice, oh, we have to be able to use apartments in a different way than just going home to sleep there and then maybe get some, some food uh, from some delivery service and stuff like that. Uh, there has to be a different realm and give the people the chance and to experiment themselves. We don't, most, many people don't work 40 hours anymore. They're working 30 hours or maybe 25 hours, spending more time at home. So I can't really say there's, there's an architect or something where we believe in that he did everything or she did everything right. But we say we in, in, as architects go with the development of, of the society that we kind of try to read in a sociological way the society and how it is changing and transforming and that we have a kind of frame for that. So actually it's more the studying of society, which is um, the godfather for these projects. Uh, thanks. There is a second question about building materials, but I'm just going to redirect that slightly toward the uh, Strasgang project and uh, just ask, um, you mentioned that cost was uh, a big uh, big decision part of the decision making on that project so i suppose that has impacted uh, construction methods and building materials that you have used on that project can you expand a little bit on how did you save uh, what made it so cheap um, uh, in that project well nowadays you would say it's a, a, a modular way of building and but all the the concrete slab and the low bearing walls are in situ mm -hmm. so uh, what made the project cheap it's actually um that there's a cer certain regularity in it because we learned a lot from this project on on the slope which was a hell of an expensive and we had like 110 different windows 
this costs a lot. So we say for Shkaskan, we will just have two windows, two different windows. Mm -hmm. So everything was thought about only one of that, or only one of that, the same bathrooms and so on. Mm -hmm. And But finally, it was so cheap that we could even afford floor heating. Mm -hmm. So there are no radiators. We, you know, we didn't want to have radiators because otherwise we couldn't open the, the, the French balcony doors. Mm -hmm. And so we said, no, we don't want to have them. We make it as cheap. And then there were like legal restrictions. I mean, Austria is a um, a neutral state, kind of neutral state, and they've got all these legal things, um, like just in case there will be war, because they're expecting this every week. Um, you have to be able to um, put in a stove in your apartment. Mm -hmm. And this stove has to be in the living room, and you have to build a chimney. And so on. And then we said, but this is crazy because if there will be war next week, there are no stoves to be bought. Mm -hmm. Just as it's just completely insane. So we said we'll have the heating plant, which is at that time was gas. Mm -hmm. And this you can change to heating with wood. Mm -hmm. And you can have every every room in your apartment will be warm, not only one room. <laughs> we were fighting the local government, and finally they said. That sounds a good idea. And then they changed the legal restrictions for this. So here we save costs again. And then there are, of course, no balconies. Um, I think the, the span of the, the these, uh, floor slabs is like 4 meter 50 and 5 meters. So we only have like 20 centimeters or 19 centimeters thick concrete slabs in there. Mm -hmm. And these prefab elements, they are um, insular like sandwich elements, which was just put to the facade. So I think we were just lucky of trying to convince the construction companies there are so many same parts that you actually can build in a way of a modular thing. Also with the, say, if you've got the same grid of rooms of load-bearing walls, so they would always have the same formwork. And they were very fast in casting the concrete, maybe like a half-Dutch system already. But due to the fact that we were cheaper than any other project built in the years before, far cheaper, 20% cheaper, uh, this was a disaster for the local government because they were subsidizing housing all the time, very expensive. And suddenly we came along, we say, you don't even need all this money. So after that, we were never invited for a housing project by the local government again. Mm. So we were invited all over Europe, but not in the city of Graz anymore. There, there's a really good question from, from Jackie. So she's saying if you were to design Graz Strasgang again in 2023, would there be anything that you would change? Would you approach it differently? How would you adapt um, it? Yes, style? because <laughs> we have been looking at this quite often also for other projects. If we can recycle it, uh, Strasgang is 10 meters wide. Mm -hmm. I would make it 11 meters wide to give it a little bit more space. And then the other issue is I would the, the, the floor heights, uh, room heights are 2 meter 40, 2 meter 45, which is a legal restriction. It doesn't, shouldn't be any less. And I would make it like 3 meters or maybe 3 meter 20, because this is an issue we have running at the moment in, in terms of sustainability because it's actually a kind of reinterpretation of historic houses in, in old cities, which have always stayed the same, um, except that they put in fiberglass cables. So what is the trick? The room height is higher, so you can have an apartment, but you can change it to a kindergarten or to an office or whatever. But if you've got 2 meter 45, you cannot make an office, you cannot make a kindergarten. It's monofunctional. And we think it should be actually a hybrid, a polyfunctional, so it has to be able to change. And if you've got like a room height of three meters, three meter twenty, then it can be housing, it can be a kindergarten, it can be an office, it can be a school or whatever. Mm -hmm. These two things I would change. Maybe a related question from Philip. Thank you for a wonderful lecture, Roger. I was wondering if you could reflect on discoveries of rules of thumb that you employ regarding the dimension, scale, or proportions, or indeterminate rooms or spaces in domestic architecture. When might the corridor become too narrow or a room too large? It's a difficult question, no? but I don't know if you want to give it a try. Yeah, because like, for example, in trusting again, this half a room, as we call it, half 
from eight square meters, and it's two meter five wide. And in these 24 apartments, every family is using this room in a different way, which is incredible. And legally, a room cannot be called a room if it is eight square meters, it has to be 10 square meters. It doesn't fit into any legal restrictions. But we even found one room, eight square, this eight square meter room, half a room, where they managed to put in the master bed, the double bed, in this tiny room, and they go in through the two doors because there are two doors. So the couple of partners, they each have one door and they go in, go in and jump into the bed. Incredible. It's it's like like a monk's cell. Of course, the monk has to be alone, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> but it's fantastic. It's it's so it's so inno innovative. It's, it's yeah. wonderful. Well, just before the lecture, you mentioned that uh, Grasstrang was uh, um, built for, uh, for for rental housing first, and then there was a possibility that residents could buy uh, uh, those uh, units, and uh, some of those were uh, turned into uh, ownership. Yes. So the yeah, that was something we were also able to propose for the the investors. It's a, um, uh, what do you call it? Higher purchase proposed so um, the people moving in there they could only rent the apartment and uh, for 10 years and then after 10 years they were able to buy and for, when renting you only pay 10 percent value added tax and when you buy you have to pay 20 percent mm -hmm. but the 10 years of rent was actually calculated for the buying already so all the time they were paying actually for the apartment, but officially renting. So they were kind of saving for 10 years, 10%, which made the apartments incredibly cheap. Yes, yes, that's, that's um, an interesting model. Um, and then maybe the, the final one, you mentioned that since 90s when the building was built, it, it's been refurbished once or even twice. Uh, did anything change significantly or it was just uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of repainted, and was there any significant structural works on it, or uh, were you part of the refurbishment process, or do you have any knowledge of it? No, the the um, in in the facade, you know, the, where the the landscape part is, which I showed, mm -hmm. these sliding elements uh, have a um, these bisole sliding elements uh, fabric mm -hmm. material, and obviously um, this was. When, when there was wind, it was like in a yacht harbor, the sound of all the, you know, chords and singing and so on. And I think this kind of aggravated the people. So now they like normal Venetian blinds mm -hmm. on that side, but they kept the stretch metal, metal um, galvanized um, sliding elements on the eastern side. Okay. And how about the ground floor? Uh, did they appropriate the ground floor? I mean, you mentioned how they moved uh, even the plants uh, and they put the new ones. And uh, but is there any change of how ground floor has is is used uh, in the in the, in the early days and in the project and uh, today? Uh, have the units that are on the ground floor have they perhaps uh, uh, you know utilized that space in front in front of them by any by any means? Yes, there was a very small strip uh, which was able, which they were able to utilize where the mutual green area is, but this is only like one meter 20. Mm -hmm. And, but they really managed to utilize it. And also the ground floor is say elevated by 45 centimeter from, from the street level, which mm -hmm. you see in the entrance area with a small ramp and the stairs. So officially they cannot even go out of the apartment. It's forbidden because mm -hmm. there are no stairs. Mm -hmm. But everybody kind of climbs out of the apartment. And of course, when you climb out of the apartment, you're so proud you managed. So you actually say, this is my private garden. And you yeah. start utilizing it. For a long time, there had problems, especially with architecture tourists, because there were loads and loads coming there. And architects are like, um, sometimes, uh, I would say bad, but they go to the facade and they look at the window. And of course, they look at the people sleeping in the bedroom there behind. <laughs> <laughs> So we've had to put up signs, especially for architecture tourists, to yeah. stay away from the facade. <laughs> so they couldn't handle that anymore. Why? And the architects would just move open the briseola and then somebody is in this bedroom there because you can move it from the outside. Yeah. I mean, it's a great building. There's no doubt about it. There's no two ways about it. But why is it so attractive to architects in particular? Hmm. 
Ooh. I think it's, it's this mixture of, of maybe the, the, the layout of it and also the roughness and it's stripped to the basics. Mm -hmm. And and also maybe now also the tourists still go, the architecture tourists still go there because it's still in some, I don't know, catalogs or uh, architecture guides to see the difference, what is happening. And at that time, actually nobody had built something like that in Europe. It was yeah. published all over and we saw a lot of copies and kind of remakes of it and so on. <clears throat> Maybe yeah. it was the, this ab abstractness of, of the um, of the plan of the layout and also of the facade, finally of the facade, because there are no 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 extras, no funny things on the soul building. All right. Yeah, let's leave it at that. Um, thank you very much. There are no more questions coming through. Um, uh, we've spent quite a lot of time already. Um, uh, Roger, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, here all, all the way in Australia. Um, we hope to see you uh, another time. And uh, thanks a lot for, for, your, uh, for your talk. And uh, thanks everyone who, who's been here tonight with us. Sarah, okay, so thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye.